Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California, you're listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Well, hello, hello to another episode of Unsugarcoated with Alia. I am so, I'm actually exuberantly happy to be here today, and I am especially happy to share something with you. I have in the studio today a guest. I have Sarah Jane. Sorry, I was looking. I'm looking up at something that my engineer is doing, and it totally <laughs> threw me off. I'm not even going to lie. But it's okay. We're real here. and We're authentic. So for those of you who know, I'm the founder of Unsugarcoated Media. We are a nonprofit media production company, and we do publishing. We do books. We do, um, we do the events. We have this podcast, of course, and then we also do short. We just have a lot of things going on, and I do not do it alone by any means at all. And so I have given my interns and staff members the opportunity to come in and co-host with me. So Sarah Jane Johnson, how are you today? I'm doing really well. How are you? I mean, girl, you're in the studio with me. <laughs> kind of geeking out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I feel like it's very important to give you guys this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And I, you've actually only been with us for a short period of time. But ho- so far, how has your experience been with Unsugarcoated Media? It has been unlike any other internship I've had, just because I'm so hands on. And you guys just kind of threw me to the wolves. And I was <laughs> just for sure, like all like with it. I couldn't have asked for like a better experience so far, especially just like unlike most other internships, it's all hands on. And so I'm loving every second of it and stuff I can use for everything. One of the biggest things for us at Unsugarcoated Media as 2020 shaped out and with COVID and, you know, you are a student, uh, well, you're a graduate student, but a lot of our interns are USC. And what's been a really honor and where we do create that impact for a lot of students are, who had to go back home, they couldn't go to you know class, they couldn't network, they couldn't meet their friends. And it's been really cool to see that through the organization, they've been able to feel like they have a voice. And from whatever yeah. part of the world, they're unfortunately stuck doing classes via Zoom, they're also able to do something mm-hmm. and feel like they're creating a difference. You work with the team, you know, how does, how are you, how are you feeling with that as well? I absolutely love my team. I found out that one of my teammates and I actually went to middle school together and we had class together in sixth grade. <laughs> and- <laughs> cool. I had no idea. <laughs> so it's been really fun. Like I talk to them actually like on a regular basis, like as if we're friends, like keeping obviously like things a little bit separate, sure. but being able to like have that relationship, especially during like Zoom university <laughs> and all of that, like it's second to none. That's amazing. And we really do give love the opportunity to give you guys a chance to be in the media world, make mm-hmm. connections, grow. I consider internship very much mentorship. I try to, you know, give the business knowledge and all that. So it's exciting to have you here. And also, you know, I give you guys the opportunity to co-produce. Mm-hmm. So you are officially a co-producer of today's episode. We will thank you for that. Um, so I kind of want to go into a little bit of what we're going to be talking about today, which is yeah. narcissism. It's a very interesting topic Mm -hmm. I was personally married to a narcissist and I'm not saying that as a bitter ex-wife you guys like the audience (laughs) needs to know that I'm not bitter I remember distinctly sitting in a in a therapist's office and here's how you can kind of know my ex-husband was a a as was a narcissist is I said will you please go to therapy with me and you know he went one time Mm -hmm. one time he would tolerate someone telling him what to do the next time for the follow-up appointment I was like can I make the appointment he was like no I'm like, even if it will save our marriage, you still won't take the appointment. Nope. I don't need someone telling me what to do. And it was just very. And so anyways, I remember being in the the therapist's office and saying, you know, will my do you it was almost like fortune teller. Do you think my relationship will work out? Like and he could see in my eyes that I that I wanted him to tell me. Yes, I wanted him to tell me, you know, your husband can change his ways. And um, he pulled out his, you know, psychology dictionary and he looked up narcissism and he read the description and he closed it. And he said, if your husband fits that, he says, I hate to tell you this, but it's very unlikely Mm -hmm. that your relationship will be what you want it to be, which to me just meant respecting me as an individual. You know, there was physical and emotional abuse taking place and, um, and, and, and other things. So I, I, I know if he hears this episode, he might be like, you're talking about me again. No, I'm talking about me and I'm talking about how you impacted me. So it's like, you know, I, I actually don't have any angst against my ex-husband. We, we co-parent decently well. And for that, I'm happy. But not everybody has that experience. Right. So I came to you and said, we need to discuss narcissism. Mm-hmm. And you said, I, I have someone in mind. I have the perfect person <laughs> to talk about it. <laughs> 
Well, I, we're definitely excited to bring her into the conversation, and we will go ahead and do and start doing that now. So, ladies and gentlemen, Erica Lauren is a true modern Renaissance woman, spending most of her life as a healthcare marketing professional in the Fortune 500 world. She walked away to explore her creative side, which led to almost a decade in the entertainment industry. She is now a trauma recovery cro coach and brain spotting therapist with specializations in narcissistic abuse recovery, sufferers of CPTSD, and helping family members and loved ones of addicts and cluster B personality disorders. She created her practice to help the victims of the disordered and has carved a niche in helping clients heal after severe emotional abuse and assisting clients in reinventing themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Erica Lauren. <laughs> Hi, Erica. How are you today? Hi. Thank you so much we've for been having, having me. We've been having technical difficulties today. I'm not even going to pretend to it. But I love it. I good. love it. So, so Erica, why don't we first just kind of start with how, you know, again, I, as I, you heard me say to Sarah, so narcissism is becoming a very prevalent word. Yes. We need to know it. We need to understand the difference, right? What do we need to know the difference between narcissism and narcissistic we're going to get into with you but i would love for you to talk about how you got specifically into that realm so um my background i actually all i ever wanted to be was a neurologist my entire life and i suffered from learning disabilities and ended up not being able to pass the mcat um and got my mba and started working in pharmaceuticals and in neurology and um that career took me really far and then i had broken my neck one of three times and I was laying flat on my back and one of my friends is because one um, wasn't enough right? right I'm so sorry right. <laughs> three times um, and one of my closest friends he's with a uh, he's a member of a very prominent entertainment family and uh, after the death of one of his relatives he had asked me if I wanted to come out and kind of take my marketing and my knowledge and put it into entertainment and start a production company and so that's how I entered the entertainment field well, I came from corporate, very structured. I didn't really know what I was getting into. And so I got more into the, the music end of things. And the more that I was seeing and the more that I was experiencing, something was not right. And ended up having a few events that literally traumatized me. And I, I committed myself to trauma, putting myself into trauma therapy and recovery. And that's where I started unfolding. First of all, these were not the first narcissists that I had in my life and I didn't even know. Uh, I was quite damaged. And so as I went through this journey, I started, I joined support groups. I became a mentor. I started training with some of the premier thought leaders in narcissism. And I realized there's a, there's a hole in the marketplace for this. And quarantine kind of brought out all of these exacerbated issues with people locked down with their narcissist and there was nowhere for them to go. So I decided that I was going to go and put all of my pain into purpose and got certified as a coach and I'm learning some amazing things. And I already, I already have a wait list, believe it or not, of, of clients that want to work with me. But I think there's a huge need for this right now. And by the way, Sarah, I do want you to feel free to jump in with any thoughts or questions. You know, um, you are a co-host today. And uh, so that's incredible. And I know that you had mentioned one of the people that you were working with, but kind of diving into the misconceptions of narcissism and narcissistic behavior. Why don't we start there? Okay. So there's a, uh, I want to make a, a distinction between narcissistic traits, which we are all born with, and they serve a very healthy purpose. And then there's true NPD or narcissistic personality disorder. And NPD is a spectrum disorder, much like autism. So you have people from a range of slightly narcissistic to sociopathic pathological narcissism. Narcissistic traits are those things, you know, everybody thinks that because we're living in a social media world and everybody's taking selfies and photos of themselves, it, that's a narcissist. No, that's a narcissistic trait where we literally fall in love with our own image. But a true narcissist happens, the way a narcissist is created, it's not genetic, it's environmental. And what happens is in the first three years of life, if that child doesn't get their primary needs met from either or both of the primary caregivers, the part of the brain that's responsible for attachment and empathy and sympathy and kindness and all of those good yummy stuff that we have as people, that doesn't develop, it becomes underdeveloped. 
So when you have that, unfortunately, as they go through life, the only person that they are concerned with is themselves and they don't learn how to have concern or care or the ability to even experience what it's life is like for somebody else in somebody else's shoes. It's interesting when you say that, uh, only because not to pick on my ex husband, but uh, he, <laughs> oh, let's he, he, somebody's gonna attack him. He's gonna dock my child support. No, I'm kidding. You better not. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no the the reality is like I, I I know his parents, and when you say that, I think about his what I know of his life, and he has amazing parents. But his dad was a doctor, and he's he was a phenomenal doctor. But I know that he always talked about how he was never there. He was always with his mom. His mom was really the one doing the child rearing. Dad was always at the hospital. So when I think about how we do generate or how we do create the environment for a narcissist, and you do have a lot of homes where parents aren't as, you know, there's a lot of parents, both of them have to work. Absolutely. How, I mean, how do we, how do we address that? How do we kind of, you know, and this is not something I know you can answer. This is just more of what we're talking about. Oh, but this is the stuff that keeps me up at night. Right, right? exactly. So, yeah. Because how do we, it's a chicken or the egg theory. And the, the problem is that once somebody develops narcissistic personality disorder, there is very little treatment available. We just don't know enough about, you know, we have different types of therapies like CBT, DBT. I'll go into some of the somatic therapies that I practice, but none of them, most of the time, narcissists don't have the ability for introspection and self-reflection. So even if they went for therapy, if you're a narcissist, and I was laughing when you were telling that story, because most narcissists that do agree to go to therapy, they end up gaslighting the therapist so bad that the victim actually gets double traumatized because the therapist doesn't believe them. Um, So... So, yeah. So, I mean, I think that ultimately when it comes down to it, 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 how do we not, because there's so many parents out there that are thinking, oh, well, if you're saying I'm gone for work and my kid's going to turn into a narcissist, you know, I mean, it, it is a very interesting part of the conversation. Peeling it back and kind of talking about what are the signs, like what really do you consider a narcissist? What are the things that we see? I know we talked about the spectrum and, mm-hmm. I, and I love that you brought that up because that's absolutely key to understand. I mean, confidence and a little bit of ego you know, knowing kind of, well, as I say, knowing who you are when you sit down to the table, that's not narcissism. That's, right. You know, and, but the, when it does go to the lack of empathy, when you can harm your partner, when you can do things that are very dismissive of the outcome, right? You're so not concerned about the outcome because you're king or you're on top. You're nothing, nothing losing anybody won't hurt you, right? Because right. You're the king of the hill. But it, it's on the one hand, I've, I've all, often thought like how cool would that be to never hurt like you're never upset about a heartbreak or you don't like if somebody passes you're just like oh okay yeah i mean there i do see the benefit of it however it's (laughs) not the healthiest when it goes yeah when it goes too yeah but i was thinking about back to your question about how do we stop this and i don't know being aware obviously and and parents need to be aware and make sure that they're really dialed in to their kids but but once that narcissism is formed, we can't fix the disordered. We can fix those of us that are considered neurotypical or not NPD. And the true inoculation to narcissism, it's so simple, but it's so challenging, which is self-love and self-respect. If you have respect for yourself and you truly love yourself, you will never allow a narcissist or anybody else to mistreat you. So what my goal is, I'm trying to get to as many people as I can and really get their self-worth, self-esteem, self-love at the maximum amount because that truly is the vaccine to narcissism. Right. Um, And some of the signs. So when Mm -hmm. we talk about the signs of narcissistic personality disorder, um, what are those? Well, what's interesting is they're pretty textbook. And once you learn it, you look at them and you go, wow, you're so unoriginal. Um, But narcissists go through a cycle and they're very methodical. Um, Once they have you in their sights and they do have specific things they look for in their targets, but that you'll go through this phase of what's called love bombing where they learn what you love what you like and all of a sudden it's it's an, and it doesn't even have to be romantic it can be in friendship but all of a sudden you meet this person that you feel oh my gosh they see me and they're able to be everything that i wanted them to be and they really do show up most narcissists are quite charismatic but if things start moving like pretty fast in a relationship platonic or otherwise that's one pretty big red flag 
Another thing, they will never ask about you. They will always make everything in the world self-centered and self-centric. They don't take accountability. Um, you'll be walking and God forbid you're watching a movie. You sit down and watch a movie and it's like, I can't watch animal movies because I just cry. But you'll sit next to a narcissist and nothing's happening. There's no tears. There's no emotion. So that's another one. The, the empathy is really the telltale kind of symptom or, or red flag is that they just don't have the ability to feel anything for other people. And that becomes very aware, like when you're expressing something or if you're upset about something and you get a flat affect, there's no reaction. You're just like, okay, right, right. right. <laughs> Is anybody home? <laughs> it's interesting because when I think about narcissists, I also think we should, you know, recognize that there's different types of relationships in which narcissists. So it, you could have one at work that you're dealing with. You could have yes. a friend that you care about, and maybe you grew up with them, and then you start to realize, all right, they're kind of narcissists. So. You know, when it comes to, you know, family and not the necessary, like, you know, outside of a, a, a lover or a partner, you know, how are some of the ways that you suggest people handle narcissistic behavior? I love this question now that I'm like through it and I get it because <laughs> when I was in it, it was just like I couldn't figure it out. But if you think about when you're around people and you get that initial con like attachment of energy, you know the people that make you feel really good and safe and the people that you're just, there's something attractive about them, but they make you feel a little off center. That's your first warning sign that you need to pay attention to something. Um, there's also, and we can get into it, there's, there's a specific thing called the narcissist gaze. Mm -hmm. When they have somebody in their target, their pupils will dilate. They become very fixed on you. It's a very seductive, even when it's in a platonic type situation. Mm -hmm. um, and you start feeling like the most important person in the world. There's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. And I've just been educating people on following your own intuition and your own gut. And if somebody starts... It, <laughs> I say if somebody has conflict with so many people other than themselves, that's another thing you want to work for. And how do you handle it? There's only one way to handle a narcissist. You run. <laughs> and fast. And fast. <laughs> Remind me of when you were in school, stop, drop, and roll. Yes. Right? Just stop, drop, and roll. Get stop, out of there. Drop, roll, and run. <laughs> run but there's a lot of people run. that can't. You know, right. a lot of people are born to narcissistic parents. And, and that's, to me, that's the hardest part is having a child grow up into that and then expecting that child not to repeat that mm -hmm. because from what I've experienced in my own practice is that if a child is born to a narcissistic parent, it's either going to become a narcissist itself or a codependent. In either way, neither are good. But what happens is when a child's raised by a narcissist, they don't ever fully develop a solid sense of identity mm -hmm. and a solid sense of self. So they go through the life, go through life people pleasing or they become a narcissist themselves, which means they just bulldoze through the world. They're so self-centered and focused. They don't really want to, it's, it's all about what's in it for them. Mm -hmm. And it's never about how can I be of service to you? Sure. And you can tell that when you're meeting people. And the other thing that, the one place that really disturbs me more than anything is when I see people in religious or spiritual roles that you know are narcissists or people on YouTube that claim to be narcissist experts and they're right. really just narcissists grooming and programming there's a lot of predatory behavior with narcissism so if somebody is you know i always say you know what the baseline is for a healthy dynamic you know when things are a little too much over the top on one side or not enough and those on either side of the extreme that's where you got to kind of ground yourself and say, what is this person wanting from me? Right. What are what are they giving to me? What are they offering to me? And what are they contributing to the relationship? It's very interesting when you talk about that. And I have a different, you know, it, I will say there is maybe a third. I mean, I hope I'm not. I, I, I definitely, I, I married my mother. Okay. I, and I, I want to talk about father. how <laughs> generation, <laughs> who are you going to marry? No, I'm going to marry your <laughs> We're going to get her therapized before she gets married to anybody. <laughs> it's it's true, though. I, I married, you know, I'm, I married somebody that now I'm like, wow, I, that's exactly. And I think I speak more to like the um, because I feel with the narcissistic personality, it, it leads to being emotionally unintelligent to really deal with complex situations that do require empathy. And, and you know, it, it's not the whole just get over it because whatever you're experiencing is making me feel uncomfortable, so I mm -hmm. need you to get over this. And it's largely why I was on my own at 14 years old. My mom was just so 
I don't care if you got to be on the street. If you don't listen to me, don't do what I say. Bye bye. And then I ended up in a relationship. And I and I also want to say that at the same token, that narcissistic behavior when we were younger made me feel like you said, like I was because everything that I had that was good about me mm -hmm. made him look better. And I think that narcissists really hone in on that, right? Yeah. They don't pick losers to date. They just don't. They they will find people that emulate what they admire or what they want and they're looking for a bump in social status they're looking for somebody that's financially successful if you know there's kind of this this polarizing part if you have a successful narcissist financially they're going to look to control their partner through money if you have a narcissist that is not financially well off they're going to exploit their partner and make sure that their partner has money so basically the reason they're called parasites for a reason they're looking to you and they're looking to you and myself we possess some quality that they admire or they think is cool and they want to literally like a vampire suck it out of us and that's why you'll hear people say oh narciss like narcissistic abuse literally sucks the soul out of you yeah because it does right yeah. they're hijacking everything about you right and they're also the other interesting thing and i can say this specifically in romantic relationships what makes them so challenging to get over is they mirror you. Right. They mirror yourself back to you. So you're really falling in love with yourself. So you end up at the end of this with no self-esteem, no self-worth, but you really fell in love with yourself. So you go yeah. back to who you were attracted to. It, and it's just hard when you know that the person that you, you fell in love with, there's no there there. Right. There's no one there. Right, right. Yeah, you know, no, I, I agree. Sarah, because I want you to feel like you're part of the conversation, mm -hmm. how have have you had any experience with narcissism that stand out to you? Um, and yes, <laughs> which that you care to share on a public podcast. Um, <laughs> Erica has helped me out a lot through it because um, I my dealing with narcissists, I've had like relationships with one, which Erica was very quick to point out. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped dropped and rolled real okay. quickly but it came more in like friendships and just kind of like in areas where i was um and it is very draining because i mean i like to think of myself as a very empathetic person and erica can probably like speak on that and so i'm a very giving and it was kind of hard because like there were people friendships relationships um maybe some family members that fall under that category and they took everything out of me and so and I had a hard time understanding why just because that doesn't selfish doesn't really cross my mind a lot so I didn't understand it and so that's one of the reasons like Erica and I became so close because we are connected through two very different circles through equestrian and a very good friend out in the entertainment industry and she just kind of walked in my life and she was like bing bang boom like they gotta go <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. Right. And I've been totally so much better since. But yeah, it just, it's more for me, friends that are kind of, yeah, fall under that. Right, right. So when we talk about uh, it's, we're going to move into surviving and, you know, according to the National Domestic Violence Hotline, on average, a woman will leave an abusive relationship seven, seven times, times before she leaves for good. Right. Speak about this. Oh, Talk, you know. oh this is the most misunderstood. By the way, I was one of those. Like, yeah, I, I was I mean, too. We, we separated yeah. so many times, I lost count, you know. And and one more thing I really have to say, I know I had a thought when she was talking, and this is where I feel not just, I, I actually care very much about the relationship my ex-husband has with my children. Right. I, I, do, I will, and I say, and I'll be very unsugarcoated, a lot of stuff I'll tolerate because I know the value. I don't want my kids to have daddy issues, right? And that's just being honest. And what I feel is a struggle for, and I'm going to ask your opinion because even from a parenting perspective, now I'm divorced and I'm a survivor. I know what I'm dealing with. And for many years, it was always, I'm crazy. Right. Yeah. I'm the one ca commenting the chaos, which I wasn't, you know, necessarily all of it. I that's was reacting. reactive abuse. I was reacting, yeah, right? That's okay, a but he reactive was convincing abuse. me I was crazy. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. We now have teenage kids that require a certain emotional level. And I see him struggling with that. And yeah. I don't know how to help it. Right. And that's the same token. I don't know how to help my daughter. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I just no, specifically no, no. threw out some information no. there. All my stuff's on blast. But you know what? It, and I'm not even faulting, my, okay, like taking away and just speaking to them as a human being or anybody. Com relationships are complex. Yes. So I understand that level. Yes. I'm not trying to throw shade. But I want to help the situation. So, you know, in, in something like that, when it 
we're going to go first to the domestic and, and, and that, but I would love for you to kind of like weave into it. How, how do we as survivors of trauma help avoid, our children? Yeah, our and, kids? Yeah. Well, the good news is there's a lot you can do. Um, as far as the leaving seven times, that's the minimum. And this is the one part that always frustrates me when, when I'm talking about survivors and abuse, because obviously to the neurotypical, that's not an abusive relationship leave like yeah. what's your problem it's not that simple narcissistic abuse is so insidious and it's so deceptive and what happens is your entire reality gets distorted your moral compass gets bent you start doing things that you swore you would never ever do and when you're gaslit constantly every single hour of every single day I know when I got out of my situation, I felt like I had been literally kicked out of the agitation cycle of a washing machine. I was so disoriented. I, I didn't even trust, like I would ask my friends all the time, okay, are you, are you sure that's blue? Are you sure? Like I didn't trust the basics with myself. And that's what they're so good at. Like this manipulation, it's brainwashing. They actually, there's a term called the narcissistic trance where I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've experienced this when you get back into the immediate vicinity of a narcissist, it's like all of a sudden you go, you lose all real time reality. And for me, it felt very dissociative. You know, I, I felt like, well, why am I saying, why am I letting this person do this? Why am I saying this? Because you just, they disarm you. And I don't know, it's, it's basically mind control. It really is. Well, I feel that as well as, you know, love the is a love, very powerful emotion, but it's a very deceptive emotion. I think people uh -huh. think because I love you, A, you love me the same way, and B, that means I'm supposed to tolerate a bunch of stuff that I actually in reality took many, many years to figure out. No, you don't. No, you don't. Well, narcissists use a lot of tactics, and I'll just touch on a few. When you have a narcissist as an intimate partner, they do some pretty sneaky things. For example, when you're in a situation of intimacy, they will always make sure to make steady and constant eye contact with you. While you're in an intimate situation, what happens to the brain? The brain automatically starts releasing oxytocin. You are now chemically, biologically bonded to this person. Right. That starts the development of the trauma bond, which we'll talk about. Okay. Um, and they'll do things like really go over the top with romantic gestures. And they'll be everything that Disney promised us but lied to us that doesn't exist. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Don't even start me on the Disney stuff. Yeah, I've definitely said that on this podcast before. Liz, they lied to you. Okay. That Disney lied. <laughs> there is no prince on a white horse coming to save you. Well, no, he is. But he's probably a jackass. And he's probably going to be cheating. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to, like, generalize. I don't mean to throw every man under the bus. But, like, in reality, Go that type it. of personality, the prince in yeah. those Disneys, he's probably a jerk. And not heterosexual. Because... <laughs> You know, no, yes, <laughs> she loves. I I'm love dead. my non-heterosexual <laughs> friends. They're the kindest. It's the they best. They don't want anything, right? You know? yeah. <laughs> exactly. And you know what? I find that they're the most open-hearted. You of know, course, they're, they're the most. They're just they're people. Yeah, yeah I love. I love it. But yeah, trauma bond. Yes, let's talk about that. trauma bond. Is what I call the narcissist heroine but we're the users of the heroin. So what happens with the trauma bond, it's like Stockholm syndrome. And for people that don't know what Stockholm syndrome is, it's where the abused falls in love with the abuser. And this line, it's you lose what's called um, cognitive dissonance, where when somebody is horrible to you and that same person is kind to you and does that intermittently and provides you with a little, a little good, a lot of bad, but then goes for a little good, right? The brain gets very confused. You develop this chemical bond to this abuser, but you don't see it as abuse because you're you're waiting for that. Oh, but I love you. I might beat the heck out of you, but I love you. And that's what we wait for. And it literally becomes a chemical addiction. Our brain goes through all of these neurochemicals, neurotransmitters. You've got endorphins. You've got, you know... Um, cortisol flying through there, you've got adrenaline flying through there, you have the oxytocin, you have the dopamine, and that's what happens is with intermittent, you know, giving and taking, you get a dopamine hit every single time they're nice to you. What happens with heroin addiction? You get a dopamine hit or any right. addiction for that matter, right? right? Right. So when you get out of a narcissistic relationship, and part of the reason so many people can't is they're addicted 
and you have to go through a detox and you have to go through rehab. It's a di little bit different because it's not a chemical substance, it's a human, which makes it even harder. And then what'll happen is you have to deal with the emotional triggers from ev like, you know, if you're with in the city, I'm sure you have that where certain I have triggers. triggers. Yeah. I have. Tr I, I didn't think I had triggers. And then yeah. my 15 year old son who and I don't mean this in any bad way is a lot like his father looks like him, has mannerisms like him. And then when he says certain things that maybe his dad might have said to me, I find I get triggered by it. I'm like, don't 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 say don't don't do that because I took myself out of that situation because I didn't appreciate that type, you know, and so I don't want you I, when he does it, I can I can tell you it triggers me. But I want to ask a little bit more about your personal story for a okay. second. Narcissism for you brought you to a point in your life where you decided that that was not it for you. Yes. Would you mind sharing a little bit about that? Tell us your personal story. Yeah. So um, when I was eight years old, I was molested by a family member who was a malignant narcissist. Um, I went to my father who I was closest to at the time and I shared with him what had happened and he had a really hard time accepting it and he didn't believe me and at that point I realized it was a shift that happened in my little eight-year-old brain where I knew my daddy wasn't going to protect me and I learned also that day that I was never going to be heard so I stopped talking and then as I got older, my ins I had, I mean, that killed my self-esteem and my self-worth. And I was already kind of an insecure kid. Right. And growing up, I developed eating disorders. I was, you know, I had gained a lot of weight from, from the abuse. And so I started that cycle. And then I realized, oh, I can control this. And I, ha I was a late bloomer with dating. Um, and then when I started dating, my first relationship was great, but then I started attracting and reenacting my relationship with my father. So men that weren't emotionally available mm -hmm. and I, that approval was so important to me. And did I know it at the time? No, but I, I now looking back, I mean, I've had eight relationships and they've all been with emotionally unavailable <laughs> men. <laughs> And then you go, wait, what, but how did I get hurt? Right, right. <laughs> um, but I think um, as I got old, I was married for 11 years and I was married to somebody that um, he was a closet alcoholic and his behavior, he, he struggled with depression. He struggled with anxiety. And I, you know, I don't, I do believe he was a narcissist. I think he was on the lower end of the spectrum but there was no emotional connection at all. And I just, it, he, he had finally lied to me about having cancer. And when I found out the truth, I couldn't look him in the face anymore is really what right. did it. And so at the same time, I was I'm moving out here to get started in entertainment. And then, you know, you meet these people that are larger than life. And um, one, I had an encounter with one and we just became very close friends best friends and I felt like this person saw me and he acknowledged me and I I mean I still I will all admit this I still have love for my abuser I do yeah. I'll always I love him because right. I know uh that the person I fell in love with was with me but that was a really powerful memory for me right you right. know um and I think what finally did it for me is I was tired of having failures, but more importantly, I was tired of feeling like I hated myself. I was tired of hating what I saw in the mirror. I was tired of feeling like it's weird because, um, you know, narcissists have the, the average mental age mentality of a 10 year old. But I realized in my emotional relationships because of my own unhealed trauma, I was about at a 15 year old, which is why I kept being attracted to these very immature men, because that's where I was at. Right. And I just was tired of being sad. And so I started looking, I've always been a proponent of therapy, but I had never done somatic therapies like EMDR or brain spotting, which uses eye movement right. to reprocess trauma. And um, when I, when I, I had been around, you know, in Hollywood, you see a lot <laughs> and a lot of traumatizing things. So there was a lot of drugs. There was a lot of alcohol. There was a lot of sex. Um, I remember being at a producer's party and it was like my first week in LA and they just started going at it on the couch next to me. Like we were yeah. just having Sunday tea. 
That's LA. Yes, <laughs> and I realized I'm not in Welcome. Kansas, and I'm from Miami, so I felt like I had a pretty good grip. You know, well, I can't lie. I remember going to because I was in the music industry as well back uh -huh. in the day. And I was at a WMC conference in, in a party in Miami, and I was just like, "Wait, what's happening next to me?" And I'm like, "I'm not ready for this." So I mean, it's an alternative. Anybody, yeah. But yeah, no. Eventually, don't worry. I had my turn in Hollywood. So. Yeah, it's an alternative reality. I mean, you hear all the time, "Oh, LA isn't normal." Like, no, it really isn't. And but more importantly, I was seeing these these young artists that were talented and filled with promise and excitement. And within a year, you see them as a shell of who they were. And I started paying attention to that. And I, I think what finally did it was being in the pandemic and having all of this time. I, I vowed when I went into quarantine, I was coming out a different person. And I really had to sit with myself. And I really had, I really stepped up the trauma work. And I just hit this breakthrough and I thought, you know what? Entertainment doesn't need one more person. Right. But the proper mental health and educated, because most therapists aren't really educated in true narcissism. It's a fairly new thing that we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's what, so I just dedicated my quarantine and I got my certifications and I studied every day. And <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know? So in that, well, did you have a question, by the way? Don't 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 uh, be shy to jump in. I was going to go back to a couple conversations because um, you may not know this, but I have a very big interest in addiction. And I feel like narcissism and addiction go hand in hand through yes, and they through. Do. Yeah. Because talking to like former um, or recovering addicts, they're like, well, I never saw myself as one, but you know, when you go through the 12 steps, like it kind of shows. And so I just kind of wanted to get your two cents and what you think between addicts and narcissism addiction, go yeah. back. It's very common that narcissists become addicts. Yeah. Addiction is the symptom. It's not the disease. Right. Yeah. And I think that's why most rehab fails because we're treating the symptoms. Right. I think that you have, again, it depends upon where the person is on the narcissism spectrum. I've seen people that are low on the narcissism spectrum and they do very well with the 12 step. Mm -hmm. The ones that are on the higher end of the spectrum, you're not gonna see that kind of success. You'll see intermittent compliance, but they can't stick with it. Right. They get bored or they decide, oh, I'm fine now. I can have a little drink. I can have a little hit. I can do whatever. And then before you know it, they're they're worse than they were when they got into a or whichever 12-step mm -hmm. program so i know that there's an emerging group of the diagnosed but aware narcissists mm -hmm. and that's great <laughs> <laughs> but that's basically giving non-narcissists the education and we really are the ones that have to make the changes mm -hmm. right right and it's interesting because i didn't get to finish my thought earlier but the fact that you brought that up is quite incredible to me i i my my biological mother as i said i married my biological mother she does she in her opinion she doesn't struggle with addiction and and i'm not actually trying to make that clinical diagnosis of her but people have felt that i i i think that for some family members it's created that barrier and i know for me um i always thought it was interesting when you said people pleasing so i grew up and got to an age where my biological parents, I recognized they were not the people that I needed them to be, and mm -hmm. I forgive them, but it was just, I was okay with cutting that relationship, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when I got married, I thought, I'm not people-pleasing anymore. I thought at that point I had already come to that moment where I realized I don't need that. But mm -hmm. and then, like you talk about the relationship and how I ended up being very, I, I did. And, and maybe that was the one person I needed to please in the world. But I did actually fall into that. So yeah. it's very interesting when you talk about that. And when we talk about uh, the ways that we can help survivors mm -hmm. of narcissism, you know, what are some of the actions that they can take? The first thing I, I do when I work with a client is I make sure they really understand what's happened to them because it's very disorienting. Um, and I, I try to get a good feel for where they're at and what their readiness is. And they have to be handled very carefully and softly. The best treatment that I can tell you, because we have, I, I had one of the worst cases of complex PTSD that my therapist had ever seen. And that is pretty much any person that's with a narcissist for any length of time is going to have the guaranteed parting gift of complex PTSD. Mm -hmm. 
the only therapies that I've done that I that I also know have clinical data to help heal are somatic therapies. And somatic therapies is really like EMDR. And I don't know if you're familiar with EMDR. Well, even if I am, for the audience, like go ahead and expand on that. So EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. And what it does is the therapist will get you into activation, will get you triggered. And then there's different stimulus they can use. It's either a light that bounces across the screen or it's vibrating paddles and the left will will ignite the right hemisphere and the right paddle or or light will ignite the left hemisphere. And it's basically going into the brain, creating new neural pathways so that trauma isn't trapped in that one spot. It gets all the rest of the brain to come in, the rationale, the understanding, the logic to come and help reprocess that trauma. And I say like EMDR is, is to me was the absolute gold standard and it really, really helped. And then I started learning brain spotting, which is an offshoot of EMDR and it's using uh, a pointer and you locate based on eye reflex where the trauma is located in the precise spot in the brain mm -hmm. and you process it there and you open what we call trauma capsules. And so what you'll find is it's, it's the hardest work you'll ever do, but it literally gives you an entire new lease on life and it will heal all of the damage. And, and they do show that if you look at brain scans of, of people that are abuse victims of narcissistic abuse, they will show that they have a traumatic brain injury. Wow, really? It's healable, mm, right. but you will see massive changes in the brain Wow, compared to somebody that hadn't. And they looked at, there was a study, and I have to remember which one it was, but it was looking at a group of abu physically abused women and narcissistically abused women. And they were looking at brain scans and pretty much the majority group of the narcissistic abuse showed brain injury as where the actual physical abuse did not. Mm -hmm. And that's why they say that sometimes the emotional, I think personally, in most cases, the emotional abuse is much harder to recover from. Right. But with physical, you always end up with the emotional anyway. So it's it's kind of like a, a dance. Right. The right. other thing I, I wanted to also talk about when, when you had brought up empathy, narcissists and em empaths, they're attracted like moths to a flame. Mm. Empaths are magnets for narcissists. <laughs> Great. Yep. Thanks. Because we have, why? Because we have softer boundaries. We are kind. We are empathic. We, you know, and they'll, they'll hook us with their sob stories. And then we're there because we're going to rush in and take care of them. And so the best thing that empathic people can do is learn boundaries. And that's right. one of the things I, I work with my clients to really help establish solid boundaries for them. Yeah, boundaries are important. Have you learned, Sarah, how to well, set we're boundaries? We're still learning. She's still working there. on it, right? She's getting there. It does. I think That's I learned my it own about. Twelve step. Oh, I'm gonna say it took till my late 30s to yeah. really, like, really, truly understand. Um, you know, I, I, I did cheat. Google gave me 10 tips for dealing with a narcissistic personality. I'll read off a couple. One of them that you said set boundaries. Number one, accept them. I think that. Well, I think that. I think what I think what that's speaking to is not accepting them. Right. It's accepting that this is what they are. Yeah. Exactly. And they're not, and the hardest thing for people is to realize that they're not rehabilitatable. That's the hardest part. Yeah. Even though their words are saying it. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh breaking the spell. That's the that's the narcissistic trance that I was talking right. about earlier. And that once you have distance, but you got to do no contact. So no contact is one of the so there's a couple tools in in our toolbox that we can use to fight narcissists. Gray rock is one method and that's where you literally do not react. You have no emotional reaction to anything. If they tell you you're the ugliest person in the world, you say, "Okay, thank you." Right. And I have not been able to do that very well, I will admit. I'm much better at the I'm more of like a a, a really pale gray rock. <laughs> But I'm getting there. I'm over here in the charcoal. <laughs> Have your moment. But no contact really is the the gold standard if you want to avoid a narcissist. And that's hard because like in your situation, you have to co-parent. Right. right. And that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other episode. Yeah, that's a whole other episode. But <laughs> if you can, no contact. And it's not to punish anybody. It's really just to protect yourself. Right. Because the only thing you can do to heal is take care of you. And right. that's the hardest thing when you mm -hmm. come out of this abuse because all you want is is your fix. And you've been, that person, the narcissist will engulf you right. and make your life, their life, your life. And then when they pull away and they, they literally just disappear, you're sitting there with all this emptiness inside because wait a minute, I, w I was responsible for all this and now what? 
Right. Well, I think it's interesting when you say that because that exact tactic is what narcissists do. Like you can say you're this and they're like, okay. And so, yep. because, you know, because, yeah. because again, going to what their mind, the mindset is there, I'm above everyone anyway. Right. Like in, in, a, in such a way, in that sense of I, I, whatever you say doesn't phase me because I mean, like you said, they have the confidence of, you know, whatever, exactly. even um, though it's false. Right. Yes. Speaking up. Yes. Speaking up. I feel that in the workplace. Not to the narcissist. Right, right. We, we have to clarify that. Don't ever call a narcissist out for being a narcissist. <laughs> yeah. Your life will become a living nightmare very quickly. <laughs> so if my ex-husband hears this episode. That's yes. what it is. <laughs> Sir, you are not a narcissist. You're not a narcissist. <laughs> you just play one really exactly. well. Exactly. <laughs> you have narcissistic traits. Okay. Um, but yeah, to speak out, get your support system together. And, and don't tell everybody because... What will happen is the, the narcissist creates, if, if they sense that you, you know who they are, what will happen is they're going to get ahead of you before you can. And they'll start a smear campaign and they'll go into your friends. They'll go into your family. They'll badmouth you. They'll tell anybody who's willing to listen what a horrible person you are. Right, right. That's when it's hard to gray rock. Yeah. But yeah. you have to accept that you're not going to be able to fight back with everybody. And the people that truly know you will know you. And the people that won't, won't. Right. Because there's definitely, and I feel for time we're going to, but it really is the conversation also of people around them adore them. And when you are the one who says, hey, guess what? He's not as perfect as he seems. It creates a conflict in their mind of like, well, wait, he does all these, you know, it's like, or this person seems so great. What? Cognitive you know? dissonance. Right. Yep. Yep. So, okay. So um, expecting pushback, you know, you're, you're trying to deal with the narcissist personality narcissistic personality and you are going to get pushback they are going to tell you or they're you know i mean like there there has pushback to be is a very kind word <laughs> i think it's much more That's intense than sweet. pushback i think it's a full throttle assault and you know my best advice to people if you find yourself in a situation do your best to get out and really understand this has nothing to do with you you are only there as a transaction and a narcissist is a 10 year old, five to 10 year old child that's, go it, this is the way I explain it. You're at the grocery store and you see the kid with, with his mom in front of you and the kid's five or seven and he wants candy and he's screaming candy mm -hmm. and he literally throws himself on the ground and, you know, has a tantrum. Right. right. That's what happens when a narcissist gets told no. And right. you have to understand and put yourself in that mentality if you can. <laughs> Remember the truth. Yes. Yeah. That's hard. That's hard, but that's why it's always important to have your support system so you can go back and say, did I imagine this? Is this true? Because you do need that verification and that backup that you're not crazy. Yes. Yeah. And you were not crazy, by the way. And the narrative that you put inside your head is also a big deal. Like, yeah, yeah. the narrative you tell yourself, uh, I deserve this, you know, um, this is my fault. If I would have done better, they would have loved me better. You know, all these type of things. So yep. remembering the truth, absolutely critical for sure. Even if you have to write post-its yeah. on your, like, reminding you of what reality is, do idea. whatever you have to do. I yeah. have notes on my phone. Yep. That's I have a note log. And, and I always tell people when they're recovering, when they get out, is to write every single thing that that person did to you. So when you have moments of distance and it's not so painful or they come back get love bombing you, you refer back to that and you can really access that emotion and that pain. And that really does help to deter you from wanting to to ever re-engage it's also good for breakups <laughs> that too <laughs> yes well any relationship with a narcissist is breakup platonic or otherwise yeah um demand action demand action i feel like from the narcissist if it's you you talked about setting the boundaries um demanding action even from yourself to say, this I, is not yeah okay. i think the more effective way is to change yourself and to heal yourself sure. because i promise you the number one question i ask get asked is i'll get like a text oh i'm going out on a date or i'm talking to this guy how do i know he's not a narcissist and here's what i'm going to say to you if you have to ask if he's a narcissist you're not ready to date because once you're healed and once you have a good solid sense of self you can spot them from space right Right. I would so agree with that. So that yeah. would I would I tell people, make sure you heal really well, do the therapy, do the work, and you won't ever have to doubt yourself again. You'll learn to trust yourself and you'll be able to spot the ones that are good for you and the ones that aren't. Right. I love that. I love that. 
For our listening audience, where can they go to learn more about you, follow your journey as you help to transform other people's lives and give them support? Because that's definitely a, another way with dealing with them. Find the support. Yes. How can people reach out to you? Well, right now, so my empire is being built as we speak. I'm leaving Los Angeles. Uh, I'm moving out of state and then I will launch my business. But I do have my my email is up and running and they can email me at Erica at Avanti. It's A V A N. N T I neurocoaching.com. Awesome. And on IG, do you have any, I, you, any social media handle that you want to share? Sorry. Um, <laughs> not that I'm going to share yet. Yes. That's <laughs> yes. Fine. No, but... that's fine. That's fine. I, you know, some do it's, it's okay, but I always want to give people the opportunity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't heard enough already, you definitely want to check her out. Um, feel free to reach out to her if you need to connect with us. Sarah Jane, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Miss Erica Lauren, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much I for having really me. really appreciate the conversation. There's thank a lot you. to unpack, but I feel like, you know, we, we can always have another episode. We can do a week's worth of this. <laughs> it needs still a series. Be, yes, <laughs> <whole> exactly. <laughs> to the rest of you, we want to thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, be sure to be back next, back next week. Thanks for sticking around and letting us be unsugarcoated. Take care.